Hey, I'm Maggie from Los Angeles. I'm Colin from Louisville. Hey, I'm Harry Nelson from Lebanon, Indiana. And the Sound of Young America is produced independently and supported by listeners like you and me. You should support the show like I did. Just visit MaximumFun.org slash donate. I'm Jesse Thorne, live on tape from my house in Los Angeles. It's The Sound of Young America from MaximumFun.org and PRI, Public Radio International. It's The Sound of Young America. I'm John Hodgman, in for Jesse Thorne. My guest is the astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. Tyson wears many hats. He's the director of the Hayden Planetarium and a research associate at the American Museum of Natural History. He's also the host of Star Talk Radio and the PBS program Nova Science Now. His upcoming projects include a new version of the TV series Cosmos, originally hosted by Carl Sagan, and a new book titled Space Chronicles. Here's a clip of Neil deGrasse Tyson hosting a NOVA program about whether it's possible to travel to Mars. Even after just a few days in the fridge, a lot of food can get pretty unappetizing, mostly because mold and bacteria begin to take over your food. So imagine eating meals that have been sitting around for two to three years. That's what the astronauts who go to Mars are going to have to do. You know, I met some chefs trying to cook up some delicious dishes that'll provide all the comforts of home, even when the dining room is a hundred million miles away. Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, welcome to The Sound of Young America. I'm happy to be in any sentence that has the word young in it. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, as I, it's, a, it's a horribly inappropriate title for a show that I am hosting, <laughs> because I am an old person, and uh, I, 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 you are ageless. You're timeless. <laughs> Sweet of you, yes. So you are the director of the Hayden Planetarium at the American Museum of Natural History. Is that that's not my so? day job? But I mean, professionally, okay. I'm an astrophysicist, and that's that's what drives how I think, the lens through which I look at the world, what drives my commentary, and and the, you know, yeah, I, I run the universe part of the American Museum of Natural History. But like I said, that's my day job, and the rest of what takes takes my time is everything else. Right. So that's just something you do for pocket money? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you got to live, you know? You got to. <laughs> what does the director of a planetarium do on a day to day basis? When you wake up in the morning, you go to the museum. Obviously, you first have to put all of the exhibits back after they came to life overnight. You have to put them back where they belong. Shh. You weren't supposed oh, to tell me. <laughs> But what does your day job entail? Yeah, here's exactly. the problem. If the astronomical exhibits came to life, that'd be the end of everything. <laughs> the asteroid strike, the black hole, right. the colliding galaxies. Yeah. You know, and in there, of course, we demoted Pluto. And so. Right. Uh, but so I, I work, I'm a member of what we have here is what we call the Department of Astrophysics. And so we have, uh, I'm among them, PhD research scientists and graduate students and postdocs. And so it's a whole little academic enclave. And for part of the time we do research on the universe occasionally we'll rethink of another exhibit and every few years we redo the space show which is sort of the flagship offering of the museum on the contents of the universe and how do you determine what needs to be updated in the space show like guess what everybody there's some more space we found exactly <laughs> we're all active scientists and so you know what needs to be rethought or represented in a new way or some things it's not like it's not as though we found that they're wrong but they're just no longer interesting can you give me an example sure for decades we didn't know the age of the universe to within a factor of two some people said it was 10 billion others said it was 20 billion years old this is a big yeah. frontier subject hubble telescope figured it out. It's like 14 billion years old, somewhere between the two numbers. It's not an interesting problem anymore because it's solved. So why spend floor space on it when there are other interesting problems that are on the frontier? So you'd be swapping exhibits based on what is interesting and what is tantalizing, even if there's nothing wrong with it as it had originally been conceived. Since the age of the universe is now known and therefore boring. <laughs> it's exactly. <laughs> did I say boring? I, maybe no, I but did. I'm saying, I'm saying okay. what is a more tantalizing problem that you would swap in? Okay. For example, uh, what was around before the Big Bang, before the beginning? And are we the only universe out there? Could there be, we have a word for it, a multiverse 
where there are multiple Big Bangs going on and multiple expanding universes. And, and there's good philosophical reasons to think that, as well as mathematical. But philosophically, it, was, it used to be, well, we're on Earth and nothing else looks like this, so we're unique. No, you're one of eight, nine planets orbiting a star. Well, the sun is surely special. Look how bright it is. No, all those little dots of light on the sky, those are stars too. Oh, well, surely this collection of stars is the universe. No, no, it's just a galaxy. There's 100 billion other galaxies. Okay, so all these galaxies, that must be the universe. Yeah, we've got the one universe. Well, maybe there's more than one universe. Are you, are you currently sitting on a shag carpet next to a lava lamp? <laughs> and my legs are bent in the <laughs> lotus position. <laughs> well, speaking of that, speaking of, well, well, of well, no, 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 I'm going to freak you out one oh, more step. Okay. So please. if you take this, you think I, do you think I can't handle it? So let's find out. So if you right. follow this through, suppose we do learn that we're in a multiverse. That would be interesting, okay? Sure. That, and, and it would be consistent with all the other sort of demotions that we've had to survive over the centuries of scientific discovery. But then you have to ask, are we just one of many multiverses? <laughs> I don't have to ask that. That's your job. That's why you, that's why you get the office at the planetarium. We'll hear about Neil deGrasse Tyson's upcoming version of the TV series Cosmos after a break. It's the Sound of Young America from MaximumFun.org and PRI, Public Radio International. You see, Jesse, I said it just like they do on the radio. Production of the Sound of Young America is supported in part by Ask Metafilter. Thousands of life's little questions answered online at ask.metafilter.com. It's the Sound of Young America... I'm John Hodgman, in for Jesse Thorne. My guest is the astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, On Twitter recently, uh, what is your Twitter handle again, sir? Neil Tyson. Thanks for uh, putting that out there. N-E-I-L-T-Y-S-O-N. Straight uh, Neil Tyson. You announced uh, that you are, uh, are planning to host a new version of the television show, The Seminal television show cosmos yes is that correct yes television series that's correct yes excuse me television so at least series. one person reads my twitter stream that's good <laughs> i think well, ma- many of us <laughs> no thank no thanks for calling that out and so that is indeed the case the original cosmos w- was hosted and in, in part created by the the famous uh astrophysicist was he an astrophysicist uh back then the word astronomer was a little more common all right so let's, used, but, let's yeah, say but that. We, we were in the same business the the original cosmos was uh, hosted and in part created by the famous astronomer Carl Sagan. Correct. Uh, for public television, I believe. Correct. 1980? Correct. Uh, uh, 14 parts? 13 parts. I had to get something wrong. <laughs> no, that's because the, a full season was was 26 weeks. That's half a 52-week year. And so if you did a half of a season, it would be 13 parts. Not everything has to be a math problem. <laughs> It was, carry the two, it's all there. We're about to begin a journey through the cosmos. We'll encounter galaxies and suns and planets, life and consciousness, coming into being, evolving, and perishing. And it's a story about us, how we achieved our present understanding of the cosmos, how the cosmos has shaped our evolution and our culture, and what our fate may be. It was an amazing landmark television series describing the whole universe, really in terms that people popularly had not thought of the universe uh, before. All true. Um, in, in Particularly in, in what we now consider to be the Sagan stereotypical billions and billions and billions. Suddenly, the, the, the minutia of our lives in the history and space of the universe was made very palpable. To us there at the end of the Carter era on on public television, uh, which I think is part of the reason why public television has become so vilified ever since. Um, what did the original show mean to you? Well, I think that's an excellent question. I was already shaped by then. I was on my way to graduate school. So I wasn't one of the many who use cosmos as a way to gain interest in science and then possibly even become a scientist. But I knew the whole trajectory of how powerful those messages would be. He wasn't just teaching you science. He was he was imparting a deep understanding of your relationship to science. 
and he was your private tour guide. It was not the. It was not one of these documentaries with a disembodied voice and lab hopping from one institution to the next with one talking head after another. He was your. He was like your friend. And our goal going forward in the 21st century version of this is to um, maintain the spirit of that show, but give it all new content and content relevant to today, delivered in ways that modern viewers uh, would most resonate. Well, now, 30 some odd years. It's a whole generation. Yeah, yeah. that is that is both uh, uh, an instant and an eon in cosmological time. Oh, how poetic. You're getting all poetic on Yeah, well, here. you know. <laughs> <laughs> I studied creative writing okay. at Yale University. So what's changed scientifically that you're going to have to account for? Well, so the original show had some burden on it that we don't have. And that was at the time, what was the most science you would get on TV? It would be like Marlo Perkins, you know, under, uh, you know, from the mutual of mutual Omaha, Omaha with Kingdom. the animals. Yeah. And that was more sort of descriptive animals. It wasn't. Is more... he the one who threw the lemmings off the cliff? <laughs> Actually, I think that was Disney. Oh, Disney okay. first showed that. And then you had the other guy in the ocean, Jacques Cousteau. And those were more sort of, I, I view them as kind of like stamp collecting science. Is Oh, here's a pretty fish, and here's a beautiful animal. But nonetheless, that was your best exposure to science you could hope for. So the original Cosmos had at least half its content delivering textbook science to you. We don't actually have that burden going forward or that obligation because you... How long do you have to sit in front of your TV with your channel surfing before you hit a, a science show? It's, it's wait an hour and there's a science show on in one of the science, um, um, one of the networks that give priority to science, you know, the science channel or discovery channel or mm -hmm. learning channel or history channel. VH1. <laughs> that's 